See, I've been out there for a long time, and I've always wondered what it looks like to uh, stand up here before you as Pastor Dave does. And I'm a little, a little, I need some help, so <laughs> I think that's a little bit more adequate to, to see what it looks like. So as I was thinking a little bit about the message this morning, I did bring along my, my step stool, and um, as, I, as I kind of thought through uh, what we're going to look at today in 2 Samuel, I, I began to wonder um, a little bit more about this. You know, it would be nice sometimes if I'm in a crowd to have another foot or maybe a foot and a half what I would need to maybe catch Dave, but, you know, to find your family, your friends in a crowd, that would be great. Um, but I think God has another message, um, even around something as simple as a step stool for us today, and, and that is a higher view, and a higher view of things, not only here on earth, but also a higher view of things uh, that are eternal. And uh, I think that I have been truly blessed uh, by being a member here, uh, and not only having Dave, um, but other people in this church who have that same view and that same commitment uh, to bringing the Word of God to us, which I think is what uh, this step stool really represents. To take, us, take time apart in, in our week, uh, to take a higher view, and to join with the people of God, whether it's, it's on Sunday morning, uh, whether it's uh, Carla leading our kids in the, work, in, in the children's church, uh, whether it's small groups or Bible studies, or whatever, whatever encourages us uh, to take a step up uh, during our week uh, to worship God, uh, to praise God, and to uh, just take a higher view of the things to come, the eternal things. Um, so if you're not there already, uh, would you turn uh, to Second Samuel? And as you do, I, I would just like, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I would like to just, uh, Dave's not here, neither is Jesse, but I am so very thankful uh, for those people in our congregation who have uh, put forth the work, Carla and Jason and many people who lead small groups, uh, I just want to say thank you to you. We know the commitment and the sacrifice that you guys have taken uh, to help lift our, my family and the families of this church up uh, so that we can have a higher view and a proper view uh, of our service. And Melody and the worship team, I don't want to forget them either. They've done a great job. Okay, um, we're taking a little break from, from what Dave has usually been preaching on, but I think, uh, as you see kind of in the title today, uh, I think we get a really good view of this very same things that Dave has been teaching on uh, from a, a passage in the Old Testament. So if you'll turn with me, um, I'm probably going to mess you up. I'm reading from a different version, but I've got the new, new, version, new international version. But uh, let's, let's look to uh, 2 Samuel 9. And David asks, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan, and he is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. And Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Do not be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan, I will restore to you all the land that belongs to your grandfather, Saul, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. And you and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Seba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth, 
Mephibosheth, lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was lame in both feet. So to fully appreciate this story, uh, we have to kind of turn back a little bit uh, and just kind of understand what's going on in the nation of Israel. Uh, we know, probably most of us are very familiar with this story, how God had chosen Abraham, uh, and he took Abraham out of his land, and he said, I'm going to give you a new land. And so they went into Canaan, uh, took him a while to get there, uh, but he finally arrived with his sons, uh, Isaac, Jacob, and his sons became the, become the nation of Israel. Uh, and as we know the story of the 12 sons, there was, as often happens with sons and brothers, there was strife, and they, they wanted to kill Joseph, the young, uh, one of the younger sons, um, but they, they went ahead and sold him, and he went down into the land of, of Egypt before his sons. And when God sent a famine, as he promised he was going to do, as we know, the Israelites all went down into Egypt, where they, for a long time, they flourished, and they did really, really well. Um, but then a new pharaoh came to power, who didn't like the idea of, of uh, people from other places being there, said, well, if they're here, we're going we're gonna to make them slaves. And so, they were, as we know, they were forced into slavery. And then they cried out to God, saying, God, this isn't a good situation. We, we're not liking the situation. Will you, will you bring us out? And sure enough, God being God, he heard their cry. He heard their cry for help. And he sent um, mirac- uh, miracles, a miraculous exodus, as we see in the book of Exodus. And, and so Moses, uh, God's servant, called them out and was, was ready to take them into the promised land. But disobedience and, uh, by Moses, as well as more likely by the people, did not let them enter. So they wandered in the promised land for 40 years, excuse me, in the desert for 40 years before they were able to enter, to enter the promised land, crossing the Jordan. And that's when we know Joseph, or excuse me, um, Joshua, thank you, Joshua, he took the job of leading them into the promised land. And they're thinking, okay, everything's going to be great and good now. Um, so we see there's this, this wild ride that Israel has been on. And sure enough, it continues. As soon as Joshua gets into the promised land, they destroy, uh, I think it was Ai. But then the next place they come into, they didn't obey God. There was one person that disobeyed God, and then they, and they, had, they suffered defeat. Um, and, and then they made contracts with people that they shouldn't have made contracts with. And so we see this wild roller coaster ride that Israel's on. And then after Joshua, there, there, there came judges. And there were some judges that did a great job in Israel. And then, so we just see that it's up and down in the, for the nation of Israel, um, from, really from their beginning. Um, and so the, the interesting thing about this is when we get uh, to Samuel, the, the book of Samuel, which is divided into Saul's reign, and then in this part into David's reign, uh, the people finally get what they want. They get a king. Uh, and so Saul, he goes out and he starts to conquer and do the Lord's work. But then he, again, also starts to disobey. And so God speaks to Samuel again and said, I need you to go anoint a new king. There's going to be a king after my own heart. And that's when he goes and anoints David. Um, and so David, he doesn't just take right over, right? Him and Saul have struggles. Uh, he he go, goes out, and he, the first thing he does is, we, is the most probably famous story in the Bible is he goes out and he conquers Goliath, uh, maybe the one greatest feat that, uh, that we know from the Bible in, in our, our Sunday school years, right? And, um, then, and then David has, has been anointed, and Saul can feel this, because Saul was the anointed one of God first. But he has felt the Spirit of the Lord leave him. And so there's times when he's tortured by, um, in, uh, by an, a spirit, an evil spirit. And the only thing that will relieve him of this is when David himself comes into Saul's room and plays his heart for, for Saul, uh, which is good for a while. But after a while, Saul understands, I've probably through this, this evil spirit, that David's the one who's going to replace him. And so what does he try and do? Twice, he try, with a spear, he tries to pin David to the wall and kill him because he knows that his leadership is at an end, and the person who's going to take it from him is David. And so they have, what you could say, a very rocky relationship at best. Um, And so that's where we find ourselves. After that, finally David and, uh, excuse me, Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle, and David finally rises to power, and that's where we find ourselves here. In fact, the the passage we just read in um, in chapter 9 comes between two chapters that I think God gives us an idea. He's actually talking about the, the battles that David has won. Uh, in chapter 8, if you read through that chapter, you'll find uh, all these places that David has done what God has wanted to do. He wants this land 
for only the Israelites, the people who were pure. Because before this land was filled with people who were idolaters. They, some of them even were worshiping, not only worshiping other gods, but they were giving their own children in sacrifice. And God said, this is not my holy people's way. I, I have set apart a holy people, this people Israel, uh, to be a land of priests, to show others who I am. And if these other people are inhabiting this land with us, no one's going to believe that I am God and that this is, this is my land. And so David is, when we come to this point in the Bible, we're finding out that, that David is beginning to do this. Uh, he has been able, with the help of God, to push these people out of the land and establish what God has always desired, this pure land. If there is such a thing, I don't know. <laughs> people tend to inhabit lands and make things impure. Um, and so we come to this, and I think one of the key verses, actually, in, in, if we go look at chapter 8 real quick with me, if we go to uh, the bottom of verse 6, uh, it says, The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. And so as we, look, as we flip over to chapter 9, again, here's David, I think, taking a pause. And I think, uh, I think this is an important time, and I think one of the reasons God led me to this chapter is because we're kind of in a week of pause, and a great thing that we get to celebrate here in America with Thanksgiving. You know, we get to take a day, maybe two days, maybe you have the whole week off, uh, depending on where you work, but what a blessing we have to, to take a pause and say, God, thanks, thanks for what you've done uh, this year. Things, things that are hard, that, that might have come, but, but thank you that you've led me through that. Thanks for the blessings, too. And I think that's really what uh, David is doing here. He's, he's taking a pause and he's saying, the only reason I am where I am is because God has put me here and because God has won the victories for me. And so as we, as we look into verse 1, um, we see what David is desiring to do. He says, is there anyone left um, in the house of Saul whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And so I think he's actually asking his servants that. He's like, he, he really, he's, he's come to this conclusion um, and again, we kind of have to go back, and if you, if you look back into um, the, the time when there was such strife between David and Saul, uh, David had an ally. It, it, this is, an, again, amazing picture of the things that have, if you've never read through uh, First and Second Samuel, it's, an, it's a really amazing picture of what God gives us there. Uh, while, while David is warring against Saul, fleeing from Saul, doing whatever he can to get away from him, he has an adversary. He has a huge ally in Saul's own son, Jonathan. And probably one of the best pictures that we have of, of a great spiritual friendship and a great deep love, uh, jo Jonathan and David shared that uh, together. Uh, in fact, um, in, it's known that in, in Israel there are only two swords. This warring country, this warring nation is trying to take over all of this country. Uh, Saul, of course, had one of them, and Jonathan had another one. But at one time, Jonathan says, David... That, you, I can see that the Lord's anointing is on you. And he gave to, to David one of the two probably most precious pieces of, of weaponry and, and really most valuable pieces of, of, of item, item you can find in all of uh, the Old Testament, a, a sword to defend yourself, defend your nation. And that was given by Jonathan uh, to David. And time and time again, we see that Saul, uh, as he looked at his son, he said, how can you be friends with this guy? Not, not only is, is he against me, he's the one that can take your kingdom. We, we understand and we know how kings and, and the monarchies rule, you know. A, son, a, a king passes down to his son the kingship, and that's how and it goes. So anyway, we get back to this, and, that's, and that's that relationship, that covenant. And at one point, Jonathan came to David, and I think Jonathan had, he had a spiritual view. He, he, he was walking on a step stool. He understood, I think, what God was doing. He saw that David was God's anointed. David was the one who was going to do the things that God wanted him to do. And so he said at one point, he said, David, make a covenant with me. Would you, would, would you make a pact with me? I see that God has been blessing you. I see that God has been with you. He said, I, and I want my family to be blessed. He's like, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but uh, again, it's, I think it's just an insight that God had given him. He said, Will you make a covenant with me that wherever you go, whatever you do, would you bless my house? And I think that's what David's remembering here. As he took pause from all the busyness of his life, he took pause and he said, I need to, I need to uphold that pact I made with my good friend, my friend who saved my life, who warned me when his own father was out to kill me. And so I think that's what he's doing here. And he says, so is there anyone in Saul's house that I can bless? 
Not because I had a great relationship with Saul, but because my friendship with Jonathan meant so much to me. And so uh, his servants reply, well, there's this guy. His name is Ziba. He used to be you know, the, the housekeeper, and he kept all the yards and everything for Saul. Maybe he knows what's going on. Um, so Saul uh, summons him to his house, and in verse 3 he says, The king asks, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul whom I can show God's kindness? It's interesting. At the beginning, he starts, who I can show kindness. Now he takes it a step further. He said, is there anyone I can show God's kindness to? Is there anyone who I can really bless here? And Ziba says, yeah, there is. There's, there is somebody. Um, there is a son of Jonathan who's still alive. Uh, and David says, oh, that's, that's great. But he adds this little phrase that kind of makes me scratch my head. I don't know about you. He, he says, not, he's not asked what condition he is. He says, but this guy, he's lame in both feet, David. And so we're kind of asking ourselves, what's, what's going on here? He's, in, he's lame in both feet. And then David asks, and he says, where is he? And he says, he's in the house of Makir of Emil in Lodabar. And if you translate Lodabar, usually it means a place of no pasture. So we're probably talking about the far eastern plains of Colorado. You know, there's not much out there. Um, and, but what, what the point is here, what we're getting at, is kind of what we talked about earlier. I think David's servants, I think they kind of washed their hands. They said, I don't know. Why don't you go talk to this guy? And Ziba, of course, he knows Saul. He knows his family. And he's thinking, I think I know what David's on to here. I've seen what other kings do. Okay? If there's bloodline still in that house, what do they want to do? Yeah. They want to kill him. Right? Even though David says, I want to show God's kindness to him. They probably thought, I've seen this before, thousands of times. You know, just, just the other day, someone invited this guy to a banquet. The next thing you know, he was, hanging, he was hanging from his neck. And so they understand what's going on. And David still pursues Mephibosheth. He says, go get him. Bring him here. I want him to come. Um, and so now we're going to move into the next part of this story, which I, I think is a very interesting part, too, um, as we see the life of Mephibosheth. Um, he is. He's a son of Jonathan, a son of Saul. And I think he's out in Nowhereville, a place where no, he's, he's probably hoping and praying that he never gets this message from the king. Because he knows what's coming too. And so he's like, I'm going to chill out here and hang out here and, and just try and be as low-key so that no one will find me. Um, but yet here he is. He gets called to come to David's palace. He gets called to, to the very thing that he was praying would never happen. Um, and so, I, I don't know, as I, as I looked through this passage and I kind of looked at it, I, to me it's kind of like a movie. So if we look in, back into Mephibosheth's life, um, we, we've learned a, little, a few things from, uh, from the Bible. We know that he was an heir. His grandson was king, and then his dad, he was also a warrior and probably a leader and the commander of the armies of Israel. And um, I could just imagine, it says that he, when... Um, when when he left, he was about five years old. But I can just imagine him. He's out in, the, in these wonderful, the majestic courts of the king, probably playing with sticks against his brother and sister or maybe against a tree because he might be the oldest. Just thinking, my dad has killed hundreds. Or, and, you know, my dad has killed many in the name of God. And Jonathan was. Jonathan was, uh, at, at times he went out, him and his arm bear, and they said, if, if the Lord gives us a sign, I'm going to go battle against these 30 people because the Lord will give these people into, into my hands. And it happened that way. And so I think he's probably heard, maybe not all of it being a little guy, but he knew uh, in his lineage, or he knows now anyway, what could have been. I could be the leader of all of Israel. I could be the one leading us into battle. So I think as he's coming, what he thinks to his death at the hands of this powerful king who's moving through, throughout Israel, he's thinking, how fitting. Here I come, back to the same palace where maybe I could be king. I should be king. And he's also thinking, this same day, when he got news, probably the worst day anyone probably in the history of the Bible has had, uh, one day he's playing, and all of a sudden there's an uproar. There's an outcry. People are running this way and that. And he's thinking, what is going on? Because he just received news that his dad and his granddad both died in battle that day. And so the palace is in an uproar. People are running and trying to get out of there. They're thinking, the Philistines, if they killed them, they're coming for us now. They're coming for us next. And so on this very same day, his nanny picks him up, scoops him up in his arms, and as they're trying to flee, 
she falls down on top of him, breaking both of his legs. And so the same day when the shame has come upon his house and he learned that he would no longer be a leader, no longer live out his dream of commanding an army and leading men into battle, it's even it's, tri it's triple fold now because he's broken both feet and with no medical or any sort of way to recuperate, he's now crippled for life. And that's what Ziba reminds David. He says, David, don't, don't do anything to this guy. He's no threat. He's crippled in both feet. And so all these things I'm sure are running, running through Mephibosheth's mind as he comes to the throne room and David invites him in. I, I can just imagine David sitting on the throne. And I think Mephibosheth, as he goes in, I think he's thinking, I bet there's David, and bet right behind him is the executioner because I'm a threat to him. Because uh, he doesn't know what, what David has said. I want to show God's kindness to him. He doesn't know that. Uh, so at this point, uh, we see this, this huge kind of the climax. And so everyone's kind of wondering, what's David going to do? His servants, Ziba, everyone kind of thinks, this, this guy's out for it. And what, do I, what does David do? I think David walks out, and he sets out a footstool. And he says, Ziba, I want you to take a step up. I want to raise your view of who God is. And, and I think David, God had used David to do that. And he did it in a couple of ways. Uh, I think we're now in, um, we'll go to verse 6. It says, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David, said Mephibosheth, at your service. Oh, excuse me. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. And David says, do not be afraid. And I think right there, Mephibosheth just went, oh. We, we learn later that he's a father. At least I'm not going to die. Just let me go back. Let me, just, let me just leave. And so at this point, I think David says, you know what? I've blessed you once, but I want, I want to give you more than that. I want to give you a double blessing. And I think this is where we see evidence of God really wanting to show himself here in the Old Testament of what he wants one day to do. He says, I don't want that you guys just live. I want that you guys are fully blessed. And so what does David say? He says, For I surely know the kindness... Uh, oh, excuse me. Seven. Uh, okay, he says, I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. And so all these dreams that he's had, I had all this land, I had all these things. David just grants it to him. But then he goes even, I don't have another stool, but he goes one step further. And he says, and you will eat at my table. You will, excuse me, you will always eat at my table. And so he says, your needs are taken care of. Not only are your needs taken care of, but now you get to have fellowship with me. You, you didn't know, David might not have known hardly anything about Mephibosheth three days prior. But now he's saying, I want to invite you to come and eat at my table. And what that really means and what that looks like in spiritual terms is, I want relationship with you. I don't want to just have you, you know, down the street. No, I want you to come be with me, to dine with me. One of the most important meals and parts of, of, of life in those days. I wanted, he, David wanted Mephibosheth, a crippled man who could offer no service to the king, who couldn't be in his army. He'd never been in battle. He can't give any type of ideas or uh, strategy to what, what was going on in Israel and in the attacks of that day. But David invites him in anyway. And so, um, as we look at this and as we uh, go on further, um, I'm going to skip down just a little bit. Uh, Ziba said to the king, um, and in verse 11 it says, Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servants to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table, and he says what it's like like one of the king's own sons. And I think, I think that's the parallel, and the, the, one of the things I love about, about this story. Um, there, I, to me, there's so many parallels to, to many of the things that Dave, uh, Pastor Dave has been preaching and going through and, and he's, as we look through the book of, of Luke. Uh, so many things that are, are so similar uh, to what this story is showing us. Again, it's amazing to me that it's stuck way back, kind of hidden in the, in the Old Testament. But I think that's where God, and we've heard David say it, he who has ears, let him hear. He who has eyes, let him see. God has given us these gems um, for us to see and appreciate not only who he 
was, but God never changes who he is. This has always been God's plan. God has had this promise in mind, not only for Mephibosheth, uh, but also for us. And so, um, as I look at this, uh, I, think, I think back to a lot of my own life. Um, how I had, there were times that I did, I struggled against God, or thinking, you know, this, these are great things, but um, one day I'll, I'll, I'll look into these things further, you know. Um, and as, as I kind of look into this, and I, the person that made me uh, think of from what Dave's been preaching li- uh, lately is, has been the person of Lazarus. Uh, as Lazarus, as in, Jesus is entering into this city, right, uh, he goes and what does he do? He shames himself. And as we look at, as we look at the shame that I, I think Mephibosheth felt uh, being called in a crippled man to, become, come, to come before a king, someone who offers nothing, what great shame. Someone who's fallen from such a great height. Probably a leader, maybe a, a king of Israel one day. He has felt so much shame. And yet, he enters fearful, and he leaves with a relationship and a place at the king's, at the king's table. Um, and then also in Matthew, uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, uh, Jesus is speaking. Uh, and I think, I think again here, we know David's life, uh, he doesn't live a perfect life. In fact, if you flip over two more chapters from what we've been reading, we see what David has done, right? Not only adultery, but then he assassinates one of his top leaders. And so we know that David's not perfect, but I think David has taken, uh, or excuse me, God has taken this passage and this part of David's life uh, to show us and remind us the person that he has coming. Uh, and, and that person, of course, is Jesus Christ, uh, showing us how he can bless us, not, not killing our life, not taking our life, but also giving us relationship eternally with him. And so in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, Jesus is speaking, he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I think Mephibosheth and this story and this image in my mind uh, is completely wraps around what, what Jesus is saying there. What you have been struggling with and having nightmares with for years, I want to erase. And David did that. And that's what God is inviting us to do as well, to come to him, to come to the person of Jesus uh, and see who he is and, and test and see. He wants to take our burden. He wants to make our, our yoke light. And he doesn't promise... Uh, he doesn't promise that everything's going to be easy, that our life is just a, a cinch like that. Uh, but he does promise hope. He, pro- he promises hope uh, that we will be at that table eating with him eternally, uh, an eternal hope. And um, I, I just, again, I, I love the imagery that, that comes out of here. Um, and I think, I think there's two, uh, two other things I want to talk about. Um, and I think one of those is, as we look at our lives, and I look at myself a lot uh, as a person of Mephibosheth, and, and I think, wow, how difficult is it sometimes? It wasn't even Mephibosheth's doing, but David, David said, I want to bless this person. I want this person to receive kindness from me and from God. And yet, how hard was it for him to do that? His servants kind of wash them their hands and say, wow, we probably know someone, but I don't think, it's, I don't think what you're doing, God, is good. And then Ziva says, he's crippled in both feet. And so sometimes culture and what people say, oh, you don't want to go to church. They don't know what's, what's good for you. And the other, the other thing I, I thought that was amazing from, uh, from Mephibosheth's life uh, is his response. Uh, as David says, I, I want to bless you. And I think Mephibosheth, he gets it right here. And again, it goes really countercultural to what we hear, the messages we hear. As we hear, build up your self-esteem. If you think you can do better, you can do better. But what does Mephibosheth say? <clears throat> In verse 8, Mephibosheth says, he bows down before David and he says, what is your servant? What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? I'm not even alive. I'm, there's, there's nothing in my life. A crippled man that can offer a king. I think that's such a, a healthy view for us to have. Uh, again, as we go back to Zacchaeus, uh, as he climbed that tree, why did he climb that tree? He knew his life was nothing. He sold himself out so that he could rob from his 
from his friends, from his own countrymen. There's nothing that he had to offer them or anyone. He said, I want to see this Jesus. I want to see who he is. Because maybe there's hope there. Because I found nothing of hope in this life. And so uh, I, think that's, I think that's the right attitude uh, that we should have. That we should say, God, in comparison to your holiness, to your glory, the greatest of us still is nothing. We're in the same condition as Mephibosheth here. And so um, that is... Um, that is what this passage is kind of meant to me. And um, as, I, as I look back and I think about uh, what God has done, even in, in these stories, uh, the last thing that, that kind of stands out to me um, is, what, is what David offered. And he didn't say it the first time when he, when he asked Mephibosheth, or told Mephibosheth that you're going to sit at my table. But he did say it in, um, at verse 11. He says, So Mephibosheth ate at David's table, and he said he ate as one of as one of the king's own sons. And that reminded me, too, of, of the glorious uh, conclusion that God has for those who believe in him. Uh, as we look at, if, if we remember from John 1, uh, verse 12 and 13, uh, Christ again is speaking. He says, uh, Yet to those who did receive him, to those who believed in Jesus' name, he gave them the right to become children of God. And so this picture uh, continues even for us today. Uh, he gave us the right to become children of God and to have that inheritance, uh, that eternal inheritance, that one day we would reign with him. We will rule with him. Uh, just like Mephibosheth thought he lost completely. Um, and the last thing I wanted to, I wanted to talk about was, is the footstool. Um, you see, the footstool I brought in today is made of wood, maybe some screws and, and a little bit of, of paint. And I do believe that, that that does represent, as we want to take a higher view of who God is, uh, there is somebody who built a footstool for us. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't actually build the, the footstool. It was built for him. It was also built out of wood, but this footstool all was used, used nails. And it wasn't painted nice and white, but it was, it was painted by the blood of a perfect carpenter's hands who wanted to raise us up, and yet he raised himself up unto death. Uh, so that we might be blessed because of his sacrifice. And so when we talk about um, that footstool and we talk about blessing, um, I, think that's, I think that's what uh, this week uh, to me is about with, with Thanksgiving and, and how we can not only identify with Mephibosheth, but how we can maybe also identify with the person of David. We know David, again, wasn't perfect, but he did take that time to reflect, to look back and say, who might I bless uh, I, said, I think God has for us this image of a footstool to raise our views, to have our views raised as we come and gather, meet together in fellowship, and learn more about who Jesus Christ is. But he's also said, I want to offer that to you as your responsibility. Uh, the church should go forth and lift other people's views up, whether we work here in the church or whether we work out um, in, in the workforce somewhere, whether we, uh, there's someone in our family who might need blessing or maybe one of our coworkers, whoever it might be, how might we be able to show God's kindness uh, this week or during the holiday season? Uh, because David did. David did that. He was faithful to God. He honored that promise. Just as Jesus Christ honored a promise that was spoken 2,000 years earlier to come and raise us up unto life and life eternal. Um, and so that is my challenge to, to all of us today. Uh, to first look and see who Jesus Christ is uh, and the blessing he has given even through, through the imagery of uh, through 2 Samuel 9 uh, and, and David lifting up Mephibosheth. But also, um, once we have come to know Jesus Christ, to, have, to do what the Word of God said, to have received him and to have become a child of God, how then can we pay it forward? How then can we help somebody else raise their view pointing them, of course, to the cross, pointing them to Jesus Christ. So with that, we'll, we'll pray and close out our time together this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for what, what you are doing, how you are working amongst us, Father. Thank you that you are opening our eyes and have opened our eyes to see who this Jesus Christ is, that you know, uh, you know every heart, even though David might not have known very much about Mephibosheth, Lord, we know that you did. You knew his name, and you know every one of our names. 
thank you again, Father God, that you have blessed us in the spiritual places, and you have raised our view. You've helped these people here and maybe people elsewhere to do that. Lord God, may we go and do likewise. Maybe there's someone you've placed on our hearts. Lord, may might we, might we take some time this week or in one of our days off to just be pensive and, and thoughtful and, and let you and your spirit uh, reign over us so that we can see how and where it is that you will guide us and that you will lead us to someone who might not know you. Thanks again for the body that we have here and, and the people that uh, have served us. And we just ask and pray, Father, that you would continue to keep them and, and bless us and, and that you would use us, that you might take our lives, although they're not perfect, and uh, use us to bless someone else. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.